In the 3rd century, a series of coastal forts were constructed along the southeast coast of Britain. Today, these are collectively known as the Saxon shore forts. The aim of this series is not just to explain when and why the forts were built, but to try and understand their environmental context and operational use. To begin with, we will look at Brancaster, or Branodunum, which was the most northerly fortification in the chain. So this field is the site of Roman Branodunum. And as you can see, there's virtually nothing, indeed absolutely nothing, Roman to be seen. It's very pretty, but you have to use a lot of imagination uh, to think what the fort might have looked like. So where is Brancaster? It is situated on the north coast of Norfolk between Kingsley and Cromer. Today it is one of several pretty villages which lie along the coastal road. This Ordnance Survey map from 1923 is helpful as it shows the offshore sandbanks which mark the approach to the wash. Their presence may have influenced Brancaster's development as a Roman port, as its harbour lay on the boundary between these shallows and the deeper water which lies to the east of Brancaster Roads. In this aerial photograph, you can see that the fort is set back from the coast on a gently rising slope. Its central point is about 12.5 metres above Ordnance Datum. In the picture, it is high tide and a creek cuts through the marshes to reach the area which was once occupied by the Vicus. Numerous small boats can be seen, either anchored in the bay or resting on the foreshore. Today, the open sea is hidden from view by the long spit of gravel and sand which houses the Royal West Norfolk Golf Club and by the dunes on Skullhead Island. But this may not always have been the case. Scientific research has shown that the coastline has changed significantly since the Roman era. For example, radiocarbon analysis has revealed that the marshes at Brancaster first began to form around 1537 AD, give or take 120 years. Another study has shown that the dunes in the grounds of the golf club, shown here, and on Skullhead Island, first developed during the Little Ice Age, with the most rapid growth taking place in the period from 1500 to 1750 AD. This photograph shows Brancaster Beach as it is today. It lies to the west of the Shingle Spit, which now houses the golf club. It illustrates how in the Roman period the fort probably looked out over a large bank of sand, which was exposed at low water and may have extended for over a mile out to sea. Perhaps like today, this foreshore was dissected by creeks, which were scoured by the ebb tide. As the sand dunes were yet to form, a lookout located in the fort would have had a clear view of the seaward approaches. Although the site at Brancaster has only been partially excavated, Hinchcliffe and Green used aerial photographs to create this diagram of the fort and its vicus, which is included in their 1985 report. The construction of the fort probably took place between 225 and 250 AD, and the new walls enclose an area of about 2.5 hectares, which makes Brancaster larger than most of the cavalry forts on Hadrian's Wall. Perhaps the defences were similar in appearance to those at Burr Castle, which are shown here. The Vicus was also comparatively large, including trackways and enclosures, which extended to the east and west of the fort. It may have covered an area of 23 hectares. This would have made it larger than the Civitas capital of Enterisonorum, the remains of which are shown in this aerial photograph. The settlement area would also have been larger than the Vicus at Vindolanda on Hadrian's Wall, which covered about 4 hectares, or that at Kirby Thor, which extended to about 12 hectares. Perhaps the size of the fort and its Vicus testify to the importance of Brancaster in late Roman Britain. So why was the fort built? Traditionally, it has been held that the forts along the southeast coast of Britain were built by the Romans to protect the interior from Saxon pirates who raided the diocese in boats, such as that found at Nydam in Denmark in the 19th century. Unfortunately, how these defences are supposed to have worked in practice is never really explained by historians or archaeologists, although it is often suggested that measures may have included the use of coastal patrols or naval vessels, such as those described by Vegetius. In more recent times, the scale of the pirate threat has been questioned, 
and instead of protecting the interior, the Saxon shore forts have been perceived as guarding a trade or supply route. Perhaps the fact that a fort was constructed at Brancaster indicates that some sort of threat did exist, but the sheer size and extent of its vicus eclipsed anything which had existed before at the nearby ports of Home Next to Sea or Burnham Overy. It suggests that a new and more important need had been identified by the Imperial Government, which required the creation of a new facility. Following the Severn campaigns in the north, Britain appears to have been a relatively peaceful province. Therefore, it seems most likely that Brancaster's sudden development was due to a changing situation on the continent. Here, as early as the reign of Caligula, the tribes to the east of the Rhine had raided Roman territory. In the 2nd century, Didius Julianus had defeated a seaborne invasion of Belgica. But in the 3rd century, the situation along the Rhine began to deteriorate. In the south, the Alemanni and other tribes pushed into Germania Superior whilst in the north, barbarian raids across the Lower Rhine became more frequent from around 240 AD. Archaeological evidence indicates that the region to the north of the Bave cologne Road, shown here as a red line, was badly affected by these raids, and here lands began to be abandoned. Elsewhere, the wars led to famine. These setbacks created a strategic risk that a loss of agricultural production might threaten the army in Germania with starvation, and force it to withdraw from what was a natural and defensible border along the Rhine. Thus it appears that at quite an early date, the Roman commanders began to put in place alternative logistical arrangements. Britain, relatively safe from attack, clearly produced a grain surplus, and was an obvious source of supply. The geography of eastern Britain may help to explain why Brancaster was now chosen as a site for a new maritime complex, in this map, we can see that several major rivers flow into the Wash. Their probable navigable limits, as evidenced by medieval documents, is shown. Within this catchment area, grain and other products, such as salt and leather, may have been transported by boat to the coast. In this context, Brancaster may have been the first harbour outside of the Wash, which could comfortably accommodate a large number of vessels. It was a potential entrepot, where river and estuarine boats could converge, and where supplies could be stored and transferred onto seagoing ships. As a port, it must have had greater potential than the facilities which already existed at home next to the sea, or Burnham Overy. However, as the previous coastal raids on Belgica had demonstrated, this new maritime supply route would need to be protected. It was perhaps for this reason that a new fort was built at Brancaster. <laughs>